We are continuing conversation with energy analyst Nisha Ramdas. So Nisha, good evening once again. Thank you for joining us. Good, good afternoon once again. Thank you again for having me. No, I want to I want to get some of the backstory, please, Nisha, because many times, and I will say sadly, good, bad, or indifferent, sometimes it feels a bit novel. Someone so young, someone who's female, is an energy analyst. What made you decide, okay, well, this is the course of action I'm going to take? Okay, hopefully I don't sound ramble on with this part. But um, I started a degree at the University of Trinidad and Tobago in petroleum engineering because I took a liking to, a pre I should say a preliminary liking to the industry. But um, upon doing so, um, I really wasn't inclined to the um, technical aspect of it. And in, in, in kind of reevaluating, I said, you know what, let me take a step back. And I said, you know what, let me weigh my options. So when I step back and I said, you know, um, let me let me try another route. So I decided to embark on a degree, um, environmental and natural resource management at the University of the West Indies. And there I just fell in love with the sector even more because um, with a degree like that, you think that it's more of the environmental side, but the natural resource management side kind of caught my eye. And upon completion of that, one of my friends suggested to me there's this program at Lockjack called the um, Sustainable Energy Management MBA. And I just said, you know what, let me do my due diligence, I researched it. And I was like, this is so amazing. And it was my first year of doing my MBA that I sat down. And um, I think one day I was just on Twitter um, explaining stuff about the budget to, to some people. And one of my friends suggested, why don't you start blogging about this? And I was like, I don't know if I'll be really good at that because this is a really complex sector to break down. And this is something that you know you have to be really committed to. And that was the first time I did a budget panel on TV. And from there, I just started my energy blog, Energy TT, because I, I, my, my view is that I was fortunate to receive a, a overall education with regards to the sector, not just technical. I received corporate finance insights. I received econ insight. I received technical. So it was like everything wrapped up into one, and I wanted to share this knowledge. So I started my blog. But at the time, that was when there was a, a dip in the oil and gas price. and. The, not much people were hiring at that point. And I just said, you know what? It's time for me to create my own lane, create my own job title. And from there, I just became Nisha Ramdas, energy analyst. I think we need some theme music to go with that, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> and in terms of the conversation that we had uh, recently, we touched on renewables. And I want to go mm -hmm. back there, please, uh, but slightly different. What kind of scale can can mm -hmm. we start from what is the minimum and i am thinking uh somebody rural uh you have a farmer who raises pigs raises sh raises uh, cows and mm -hmm. they say okay well i wonder if i can use something um like biogas what are what mm -hmm. are some of the minimum factors that we need to be aware of if we're trying to make that kind of switch Okay, so apart from, okay, let's start from your um, domestic use level and then we'll go to the farmers and we talk about like what is needed, the guidelines, that sort of stuff, right? So in domestic use, there are many things you can um, implement in your house with regards to renewables. So a lot of people use solar water heaters. Um, there are different aspects that you can introduce to your house. And we see that this model has been adopted in Barbados. Barbados is big on solar water heaters. There's just one example, okay? And what you need to do with that is make sure one, your installation is proper, and two, there are guidelines that you need to adhere by provided by the um, Electricity Co Commission of, Tr of Trinidad and Tobago, TNZ. So what you need to do is make sure everything is up to standard. Um, they have literally a stringent set of guidelines that you need to follow for these things. Apart from that, um, a lot of people might install and just kind of go off grid and that kind of thing. Um, while it is acceptable at times, again, you need to have basically the blessing of TNTech. You need to make sure everything is properly well up to standard. And um, 
what what we see happening and what was being introduced is that we need to um we spoke about this last week we need to kind of go back to the um the tariff feeding tariffs and the um the policies and legislation surrounding implementing renewables in your home so unless these things are undone i want to reiterate it is it is illegal to put power back onto the grid so if you're going into renewables like you need to go completely off grid right and i think it's important for the information gap to be bridged because a lot of people want to implement certain things in their house example the solar water heater again um i'm by no means an installation expert <laughs> so i cannot tell you what make model and brand to get but what i can tell you is somebody you need to consult before doing so is the electricity commission of trinidad and tobago again tntec with regards to um farmers and waste the energy so we've seen that there have been studies um regarding waste the energy in trinidad and tobago one example was a study done by um professor adutsi um dr solange kelly I remember she taught me thermodynamics in my year at TTT. She's an amazing lecturer. Um, she did a study and said that it is feasible, but it needs to be managed well. And there needs, like, even though these again, the startup cost might be a bit, you know, on the expensive side, it is something that would benefit us in the long run. With regards to farmers, if we're looking at a smaller scale, I reiterate again: you need to go through the TNTech to make sure you are up to standards at all points because you don't want to implement these these expensive technologies in your house and then you're not meeting the requirements and see it's like come stay home and say well you know what you need to stop this whatever 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 so farmers do have the option because a part of the waste of energy is that biogas you know converting it into energy and that sort of thing and i think it is a feasible option it also depends on the type of farm you have the the type of animals you raise whether it's pigs whether it's cows that kind of thing no yes and we get the point and i'm thinking that we need to, it will do us well to have a conversation with tn tech to be able to raise that level of awareness but uh are there other types of waste that you see being able to go from waste to energy um what i can say about this is while i've been doing my mba i've seen a lot of projects um studies happening where people are thinking about using because we have like the dumps are like maximum capacity about you know so we have that supply of waste to be converted to energy but also we need proper infrastructure proper management um how is this going to go and i think that is the key point here we can't just say okay let's go to waste energy it is a feasible option and it is eliminating waste within our region our country sorry about the region but it is something that needs to be managed well and it is something that needs to be discussed well and i think it was in 2018 um the ministry of energy and energy industries they are um, seeking consultants with regards to waste energy projects and i think that's a, a step in a good in a good direction because it's allowing for people with the technical and um capacity basically to kind of come out and show well you know what we have the 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 knowledge and the experience let's capitalize on this and you know make the country more energy efficient you know cut back our usage of of fuel and natural gas and that kind of stuff now, you started off talking about being on a panel. We're not going to ask you to speak to the budget but at, or what you'd like to see in it. But when we come back, we want to get your points or your takeaways from how energy and en in energy industries have been addressed in the PNM's manifesto. So stay with us. We come back speaking with Nisha Ramdas after this. Welcome back. We are speaking with energy analyst, blogger, writer, Nisha Ramdas. We'll actually put her website up for you to see in, in a bit. But Nisha, I want to start back by asking, what are you paying most attention to in the with regard to energy in the release the recently released PNM's manifesto? Okay, with regards to the manifesto, I must state that the energy section of it, I really found it to be very comprehensive. If somebody from the general public wants to read it, um, it was really um, broken on well. I think there were points noted that we should pay attention to. Um, I think the manifesto is also a good measure of what we should hold our governments accountable by. 
So if you say that you wish to do X, Y, Z in your manifesto, this is basically what we're going to grade you on for the next five years, right? Obviously, you know, things would happen. Not everything could be achieved. But the things I'd like to pick out that really stood out to me, and I think we should have a focus on it, is um, the energy efficiency section. So let me touch a bit on that. Um, they spoke about having an energy conservation, an energy efficiency policy and action plan. Um, I'd like to see more about this, you know, delve into this more. Um, we saw that um, when I think Minister Hunt was the Minister of Public Utilities, there was an energy efficiency, um, I think it was committee put together and they have been, I know some of my peers are on that committee and they have been working towards it. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, I think something else that you touched on, which we should pay close attention to, is um, they, they spoke about accelerating the CNG conversion program. So I agree, CNG is a step forward. Mind you, might be behind the curve because this has been something that's been occurring in the world a while now. But I think for this to happen and a barrier to this happening is the lack of infrastructure in place for it, meaning that technicians that are qualified to handle CNG cars, um, fuel stations. I think there needs to be a, a, like more fuel stations to encourage people to do this. Um, this also applies to the electric vehicle situation. So obviously, we would naturally move to the electric vehicle um, because we've seen it happening in the world. You know, it's the next step. But I think for this to happen, again, we need more infrastructure. We need more mechanics able to handle these cars, um, to, to, you know, service these cars. We need more stations where people could, you know, charge up on these kind of things. And um, apart from that, I think another point that really stood out to me is we want to basically market our energy service sector. And I think this is something we don't necessarily do enough. And I think we're in the perfect position to do that now, seeing what's happening in the Guyana Suriname Basin. So our friends across the South America, in South America, they are now embarking on this new journey. And that Guyana Suriname Basin is a proverbial coal mine. And I think we have the potential to lend our expertise or capacity Obviously, we want them to embark on this journey and it, it be their primary um, focus and their target. But we also want to lend assistance because at the end of the day, our goal should be towards be like creating a, a big, like a bigger, better Caribbean economy, e integrated Caribbean business industry. Like these are things we should be working towards. And I think we can lend expertise in that, in that aspect. I think we have a great energy service sector. I work for an energy service company. So this is why I'm saying that. And I think it's a great opportunity for us. But sometimes I wonder whether or not we are paying as much attention as we should, because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it's one thing to say, OK, well, we can do this is, is another thing to say mm -hmm. we can do that. But uh, I follow up on your point, and I affirm your point that if we want to have this amount of electric cars by, by this time, it makes sense to have to raise the capacity in-house of people who are able to treat with those uh, models because mm -hmm. I can see many people wanting to go to the normal mechanic and the mechanic saying, I don't know how to deal I with that. I don't know how know. to deal with it. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. We need to offer. And this is, where, this is where capacity building and technical capacity building comes in. And I know um, some schools have been offering um, like certifications in dealing with CNG and stuff. I think my brother did a program on that recently. And I think we need to mainstream this more. So it shouldn't just be a certificate or whatever. We should be actually providing incentives to some mechanics to say, you know what, well, this, this, this course is offered at a significantly subsidized or lower rate. Um, what do you think about doing it? Because this is the future. This is the way forward. And with that, what is your ideal energy situation in terms of this is what I want to see Trinidad and Tobago doing by the year 2030? And on the flip, on, on, to back, after that question, I'm asking, what are some of the steps you think we need to take to get there? Okay, so I'll cover my 
my hopes and I will cover the steps to correspond with them one by one. So what I'd like to see, and anytime you hear me speak, you will hear me speak about diversifying our energy mix. And this ties in, it's very cyclical. So everything relates to the other. Um, diversifying our energy mix, and I'll reiterate the point I made last week. This means that we're now opening up the supply of gas that usually goes to power generation. In doing so, we can now use our displaced gas to create more energy products, to generate more revenue. Also by doing that, we're now optimizing the use of one natural gas molecule and we're creating more revenue from that one natural gas molecule. Um, I think something else I'd like to see, I'd like to see us at least attempt to meet our um, commitments made in our nationally um, determined contributions, which comes from the whole Paris Agreement, COP15, all of that, right? I would like to see us become a more energy efficient an energy aware nation because we need to ensure that we are more energy secure. And I use some terms there that might seem straightforward, but much, much people don't understand. And if you don't understand, you won't be, you won't feel this, this, this need to become more energy aware. What do we mean by more energy aware? We need to take stock on a domestic, on a commercial, on an industrial level how we're using energy. We don't want to to default to this, this wastage. And we need to, to work towards energy security. And I say energy security because the energy market, the global energy market is very volatile. We've seen what happened this year with regards to the oil price dropping below, um, below um, zero. It, it was negative at a point. And I think that we don't want our economy to be directly tied to this fluctuating prices, volatile price, because we don't want to be held ransom basically by this price. And I think in order to do that, we need to take stock. Like I'm, I'm, I always say I'm not an advocate for completely getting rid of oil and gas. That's, that's not what I'm about. I'm more about managing oil and gas more sustainably in a way where not just our generation, our generation after us benefits, but it's a long term thing. And we also need to take into consideration that oil and gas is non-renewable. It is finite. It will run out at some point. What are our contingency plans? What are we planning to do? And I think even though we may not get those things done by 2030, I think I would like to see and I would like to be a part of at least making some kind of policy in the right direction, drafting legislation, ensuring that we don't end up in the position we've ended up in before. All right, and that is a beautiful point on which to leave it. Thank you so much, Nisha Ramdas, uh, for giving us some more insight and staying with us for another one. And we want to thank no you for tuning in on behalf of the entire news team. I'm DK Rosta. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Mm -hmm.